Hi everyone and welcome to a Business Today show number three, Gerard, and it is action packed today. It is all about information and information that you can use in your business immediately. Absolutely. Now, we're going to, we're mixing it up a little bit. We've got our special guest back in, but one of the topics that came up was about recruiting. Without staff, we can't implement our, our, our business strategies. Without staff, you will have to do everything yourself. So it's so important to get the right person in the right position from day one. Absolutely, and I had the pleasure of Mr. Andrew Ford popped into our lounge and we, yeah, we turned the cameras on and I had a bit of a chat with Andrew. It was really interesting, I thought. I, I enjoyed his talk so much because some of the things, um, you know about it and you start mm. doing it. And this just reminded me to remind my clients, you know, for example, like of the exit strategies, yes. do that. Absolutely. Great information. Here he is, Mr. Andrew Ford, talking about recruiting and <laughs> retaining. This is what happens when you go live, isn't it? Retaining staff. And he has got some really solid information. Let's cut to the video now. Well, welcome back, Andrew, for another session. Thank you, Michael. Geez, we got a, a lot of response from uh, the last time growing your business and understanding why you want to grow it. Yeah, so it's really important, isn't it? I think a lot of people overlook that. They're just not sure why they're even pursuing growth and is it the best thing for them personally? Yeah, I think one of the feedbacks we got was a really interesting point you made about making sure there's enough cash in the business to sustain the growth, not just take it out to pay mortgages off. And yes. it was kind of almost counterintuitive, but then people kind of got it. Yeah, and I think a lot of business honestly just don't have the profitability to get much bigger, like especially if they're sort of, you know, picking an extreme example, like a lawn mowing type round, mm. it's very hard with the sort of money they're charging and the margins and it's just really time for effort. Um, it's, it's just not enough money to create an empire out of that. So I think it's important you realise your profitability going forward too and how much growth you can get. Because talking about that, when we, when we talked afterwards off camera, we talked about profitability and how it then enables you to employ staff. Mm -hmm. And I went, it takes a bit more than just having the money to employ the staff and you've gone through a lot with yourself and a lot of attitudes and I thought what a great conversation to have with you because Ford and Doonan and the gymnasium and your other businesses all employ staff yep. and I thought let's dig a little bit deeper on what you've learned the lessons about employing people. Yeah, well, it's never easy, is it? Let's be <laughs> honest. And uh, depending on what sort of person you're chasing, still there's a massive skill shortage in the air conditioning and refrigeration um, industry for service technicians. And we very hard to get good ones. And, and the ones you apply for the jobs tend to be the ones that go around the industry working for various people, but never for that long. So it's very, very hard. And of course, the money then goes up. There's a, mm. a, a supply and demand situation. So we can put an ad in in summer and get nobody even apply for a job. So in our particular space of that area, it's very hard. It's actually limiting our growth. We could grow a lot more if we could just harness and recruit enough techs to keep the growth going. But it almost limits us like that, which is very frustrating. I think uh, pest control run the same problems as well. Right. They, they run through the same, the same issues. But you, you hear a lot about when you're recruiting. So you do you then do your recruiting almost based on seasons? You know when it's hard and yeah. when it's a better time to get people? Absolutely. And trying to get a service technician in the middle of summer is quite impossible almost, <laughs> needless to say. Um, but we definitely try to forecast. But of course, in our case, the weather is very much decides how much workload we've got through summer. So we never know what the weather's going to be. So we're a bit mm. understaffed, for example, in Perth this summer. Um, because it turned out to be a really hot one and we didn't have enough techs and we were banking up for two weeks. But yes, we look forward into our work, like our mm. working handbook and that sort of thing to, to obviously try to model yeah. what staffing we're going to need and recruit earlier than, than we need them. So for businesses in that growth, going back to what you talked about last time, and they're looking at employing their first and second staff member, is when you consult with them, you do this uh, quite regularly with business owners, is this where you start with them, this, this modelling that you talk about? Correct, yeah, it all goes back to the business plan, doesn't it? And really the financials will tell anybody who knows what they're looking for, <laughs> exactly what's going on and is there that profitability and is there the retained earnings? Because of course, if you're planning growth, logically you start with the staff, but the growth and the staff don't automatically happen exactly at the same time. So you might have the staff for two, three, four months before that revenue really starts kicking in to sustain them, which means your profitability is gonna drop, if not even potentially a loss for two, three months until wow. that revenue comes in. So that's again, going back to why the profitability and the retained earnings in the business mm. is so critical before embarking on it. 
what are some of the lessons you've learned about employing people? Because everyone's different. And you hear sometimes, only recruit, only recruit people who match your values and then sometimes if it's a skill shortage, it's kind of like, I'll just take who I can get. Oh, exactly. <laughs> Through the uh, mining boom here in WA and the housing industry boom at the same time, if they had a heartbeat, we hire them. <laughs> Seriously. And that obviously makes then the other parts of the business more difficult, like maintain the service levels. If the people aren't necessarily your first choice, but you just need them, yeah. they're not always delivering the, that, what, you, what you need out of them, but you've got to do what you've got to do. So, um, so, so definitely, so other tips for recruiting is mm. always check references. I think people read uh, people's resume and maybe some references that may be attached and go, well, that looks really good. But of course, they're not always bona fide. So I think it's very valuable 15, 20 minute phone calls to at least one, two, potentially three of them. Uh, and one of the questions I ask is, would you hire this person again? And that I find is a very key question. And they don't have to say whether they like them, don't like them, but it allows them to say the truth. Honestly. Without, yeah, honestly as well. And if they say no, then you don't need to ask almost any more questions. Yeah. And I suppose it's, I suppose a few people feel a bit awkward when you say, well, do you like some, That's most right. of us are nice and especially a lot of business owners are quite placid in, they're not into downing people. So they're right. more likely to say, oh, they're lovely, whatever, even in the back of their mind, they're going, but that's a very clever question. Would you hire yeah. them? Let them off the hook. Let them off the hook. And they can say the truth. But and also, you're very conscious that you don't want a reputation that, you, that you've slandered anybody who was a previous employee, whether they deserved it or not. Mm. So you're right. Well, there's a culture that we don't go around. Um, I don't think it does anybody any favour. So this way, I find that question is very pertinent. Yeah. When you take people into a business, yep. what do you do when they? when they first come like what is your actual selection process and then integrating them into Ford and Doonan especially Ford and Doonan because it's got such a strong brand recognition yeah. and a reputation to uphold yeah definitely so of course the normal interviewing process mm. often we've used um, there's a company in Perth here called Talent Lister and what they do they're not like a recruitment agency per se they go and find the person and here you go for quite a large fee often they charge a, a relatively small amount and they shortlist them for you and put them into like an Excel spreadsheet or for one of a description. Mm -hmm. And with the green and red dots for the different strengths and attributes that you've listed. So they really make the recruiting process a lot. Because so, for example, receptionists, we've got 350, 400 applications for the last receptionist position, being a junior role as well, which yeah. is inundated. It's very hard for the HR person to go through all those. It's demoralizing. Um, so this gets it down to a list of 10 or 20, whatever the mm. description you ask that person to do. And we found that a very powerful tool. Um, also, we also go and check Facebook. So another tip, I think we discussed <laughs> that last week, um, or last yeah, uh, session, was watch what you put on your Facebook because we, and I know a lot of other employers, do go back and look at that, especially the younger people, because it tells you a lot about the people. Well, I remember there was a, a young lady went for quite a high powered job and they said, do not tell anybody. And she got down in the car park and put straight on her Facebook, I just went to interview at such and such. It all went well, I think I'm in with a good chance. And the text came back, you got told not to tell anyone, your chances have disappeared. Yeah, well, <laughs> fair enough, too, isn't it? Just did the opposite of what she was asked to do. Yeah. yeah. So onboarding wise, um, again, depending if it's a field staff person or an office one, let's talk about the field staff now. Mm. We, we allocate virtually a full day of inductions for them. They've got already have had their um, safety card done, then we take them through an in-house safety training video with a little test after it, yep. then we send them off for a medical test and a drug test, which is mandatory for all field staff. So we know when they come to us, that have they got any pre-existing injuries, for example, yep. that may affect the workers' compensation, that is say drug testing, self-explanatory. Um, and the whole process, yeah, generally takes a whole day. We make sure we you know, meet everybody, walk yes. them around the office, introduce them to everyone, which I'm sure they don't remember everyone's name. Um, yeah. But just try and make them feel part of that family too. And yeah. we look very much, and they say this is a common common saying, is hire, hire for EQ, not IQ, because you can always train people a skill, but you can't necessarily train them a personality trait. So I think that's another key takeaway. Not that that would be your, necessarily your only benchmark, but certainly should be in your thinking to make sure they are a fit culturally. Yeah, and I've heard that said before. A lot of a lot of the businesses that are looking to grow are, are going. Sometimes they need some basic skills, but they don't have all the skills. They'll they'll not they'll put less weighting on that compared mm. to the weighting they'll put on the actual person's personality. Correct. Yeah, and on, on personalities, we've also just about dealt with them in. in one, it's just like a disc profiling, so a personality mm. profile. Like it's not an official disc one. 
but what it does is it breaks into the four quadrants of the different personality types. And I think that's really important if you know what personality type they are, A, they might not even be suitable for the job you're potentially wanting them to do, um, or you know how to handle them better when they are in that position. Yeah. And of course, we're never all in the four quadrants directly into one. We're always a little mm. bit of something, but we've always got a, a leaning towards one of those four personality traits. So mm. if by ascertaining that, I think that's a really powerful thing to know who you're working with and yeah. what their strengths and weaknesses may be. Yeah, I suppose the, the hard or the curly questions come at the end when you re -embort, when you onboard someone and then they're not working out in that trial period. Yes. And a lot of business owners, purely because of their own personality, find this bit a little bit difficult and very challenging and find it difficult to let people yeah. go. Do, have you over the years developed systems for this yourself? Yeah, well, especially once you're above 15 employees, of course you've got the unfair dismissal, so it's quite a process, if, you, if, if they're not in probation that would be, mm. um, of you know, helping them, training them in their weaknesses and that sort of thing. Um, but if they're in the probation period, Sometimes you just got to bite the bullet and it is hard and it's not enjoyable and I don't think anybody really enjoys um, you know, letting somebody go. But yeah. really, it's, you have to, I think, reframe it in your own head that you're probably doing them a favour as much as you are the company and yourself because mm. if they're not a fit for the job, they're not going to be happy and they won't last long anyway. So yeah. you're almost helping them find somewhere. And I had a classic example of a, of a person, this is going back many years, who worked for us, a lady, and she was a, a talker and she wasn't that productive <laughs> and she disrupted a lot of people, lovely person. And she came back and I sat at I said, look, this, we've got to have to let you go, you know. And she finished up going into the travel industry, working for a travel agent. And that was her forte. And in that role, she just soared and now she's one of the high performers because that job's all about talking, yes. and networking and that sort of thing. And she was in the right job there, but she wasn't in the right job with us. Yeah. So I actually did her a favour letting her go because right. since she left us, she's just gone, her career's gone skyward. Mm. When you, and I just want to talk, because this is a, an important point, letting people go, do you have a structured way of doing it? I mean, do you document it? Do you have someone in the room with you when you do yes. these things? How do you go about that part? And I suppose the same applies to entering. Do you, have, do you document everything? Do you have someone in the room when, you, when you're recruiting? Yeah. We always have two people generally interviewing, maybe not the first round, but it's definitely the second round of interviews when we're down to the final three or five. Yep. Always have two people, and definitely two people in any sort of uh, let going situation. Um, <laughs> Just because, as we know, just to protect the company and mm. they say you said one thing, all that sort of thing. So you have to watch your back these days a lot. Mm. And also we have implemented a couple of years ago, which I find in, so, so valuable, is we do exit interviews. Right. So every person that leaves, be it by their choice or our choice, yeah. um, we go through and the HR manager sits down with them and they answer a series of questions and we want candidness we don't and it's very confidential it won't go to anybody else except basically myself and the other director yep. and the hr person hearing it but we get so much truth come out of those exit interviews so it's a really good tip and it only has to be a few questions things mm. like one of the questions we ask is are we at the risk of losing any other staff in your department so those sort of nuggets Ooh. of information you, and you know often you know most people will actually tell you the truth some are very uh, yeah. coy and don't want to say it and maintain the zip yeah but most of the people do open up but sometimes their silence can tell you things as well absolutely yeah so you can learn yeah. a lot about the culture or, and you're so insulated depending on how big the business is from the front line of the mm. employees and what they're really thinking like whether they talk to the boss they're always friendly and happy what yeah. they're saying when they're not around is often two different mm. things this is a way of ascertaining that and I suppose coming back, and I just want to talk about people, just because I am conscious of your time on this, but people looking at getting that first employee or second employee, if you flick back 35 years, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> you and Kyle, and you're going to put your, I know you had mum, but then you're actually going to employ what we call the first real employee from yeah. outside of that zone. What was it? How did you manage it mentally, letting some part of the business be controlled by somebody yeah, else? Yeah, that, that's one of the other key inhibitors I think in people's business growth is that ability to let go Michael so I personally didn't have a problem with it because I'm not a perfectionist in that regard that right. I have to do everything exactly right yeah some people say I'm a little bit OCD but um, I'm, I'm happy to accept near enough as long as it's to an acceptable standard yeah. so um, and so we didn't really have a big problem with that and it was actually an apprentice who was our first employee so we already were nurturing them and watching yes. them and they were really just following us around to a large degree yeah. until they got their stripes and now with such a large task force, my last question would be, how do you manage such a large workforce now? 
Yeah, it's, it's, and we've got a few challenges right at the moment too. And I think every business with a certain number of staff onwards, probably any number of staff, that can be your biggest headache, you know, mm. of making everyone happy. And sometimes you just feel like you're just placating everybody and yeah. you can't say what you really want to say, just do your bloody job, you know. <laughs> um, but that's the game you have to play and that's, it. that's the modern world we live in. So it can be really frustrating. I, I certainly don't have a silver bullet answers to, to everything on, on recruitment training mm. and, and keeping them. But I think you just got to have fun at work. That's one of our core values. I'm like, we've got five of them, it's a family and having fun. You can't make it always too serious, yeah. which is often hard to do because business is quite serious when there's money involved, of course. But you also have to throw some laughs in and just laugh some things off and make sure you have a good time, not make it too serious. Well, Andrew has certainly got some fantastic information there. And especially the, the tips. And that's what we say, if, if you listen to these, the, these, these shows of us, there mm. will be golden nuggets that you can take and implement that will save you money and make you money. Yeah. And from our other shows, people have actually started sending in questions. Uh, so we can, and you actually heard me ask Andrew a couple of those questions. Uh, so look, if you've got a question for Andrew or any of our guests, just write to us at info at Worthington Stoop. It'll be in the ticker tape going down below there. Just put their name in the subject line so we know who to address the question to and put the question in that description box, I suppose. I mean, all these are very successful business people. Mm. Normally you will not have access to them. No. Now you do. Yes. Talking about successful business people, John Bruins joined us again. Uh, we had him in the pool room and uh, <laughs> we got a pool table downstairs and he was, we we're having a chat with him. And he started talking about risk in business and how to manage your risk and security. Now, John is the family business advisor of the year. So he really does know his stuff. When you get to security, it's one of those things that we normally don't think about. No. Uh, just like, for example, how to lock up your, your, your files with all your, your personnel files. And Something like that can really ruin your business. I know. He actually talks, I don't want to give too much away, but he talks about passwords. Now, I don't know about oh. you, but trying to remember the things. It's a nightmare. <laughs> nightmare. <laughs> Let's cut to John right now. He's talking about risk and security in business, a question he often gets asked for. Mr. John Bruins, he is the Family Business Advisor of the Year. You're going to get a lot out of this interview. A number of my clients have conversations about risk and security. And something that comes up almost every time is when we talk about passwords. Passwords to the internet, passwords to your website, passwords to your domain, passwords to social media sites, or even supplier passwords. Sometimes you can have connections via the internet with suppliers or even your clients. So who's got those passwords? Where are they kept? Are they secure? Because believe me, not everybody keeps their passwords secure. I've been caught out myself. So think about that and write a list. It's a critical thing to have a list just for you. Somewhere that here is your security issue, you need to keep it secure, know how you can access it, and possibly some other trusted person on your staff need to know about that. Another thing we think about is, is there a safe on site? And what's kept in the safe? Are they appropriate things that you keep in the safe? <laughs> Maybe it's your passwords. Sometimes safes can invite people into your business, just the fact that you have a safe. So ask the question, is it necessary that you have a safe? Or should you be keeping other things off site or with the bank? And another thing, finally, on this security and uh, idea is uh, keys. I know for myself I have keys everywhere and I know what key matches what lock. What happens if you don't have a tag marking what key that is? So think about that, the keys, uh, really keys to plant and equipment, keys to storage areas, uh, keys to safes, something we just mentioned, or even uh, keys to company vehicles. Sometimes companies with lots of vehicles keep their spare keys together, but we don't know which key goes to which vehicle. And it, when I'm talking vehicles, I'm not just talking cars, I'm talking forklifts, I'm talking wheel loaders, I'm talking bikes, lots and lots of things. Sometimes you might just have a series of locks with a series of keys that can go on to other things. Tell me a story. 
Oh, okay. The reason I focus on keys is I had a situation uh, in my family where uh, my father-in-law passed. There was a key sitting on his ink blotter on his desk. We were there with the key, looked through every lock in the house, didn't fit anything. We went to the other house, the holiday uh, place. We tried that key in every lock and it wouldn't fit. Do you know, to this day, and he's been gone for a few years now, we never ever found out what lock that key that held importance to him sitting on his desk, we never found out what it worked for. You know, what I got out of that, Gerard, and I, just listening to it again when we we're just filming, um, was how he uses that software program to keep yeah. all his passwords in one spot. So you only have to remember one and not 50 million of them. Well, that's definitely one thing I think I'm going to do today. Yes. Is, is to get that app. I'm, I was always scared to use the app, mm. but if, if people recommend it, I will give it a try. You, you know the other thing, and I'm just listening to you then, I think this is the point you often make. If you can just take one thing and implement. That's the most important part. People <laughs> listen to these things, uh, but they don't implement. Nothing is going to change in your business unless you implement. Yeah. Look, keep putting your questions even in the sidebar there. We can see them. Look, we are doing this very new. We've got the switching stuff going on. So while the videos are playing, then we'll get to your message and answer then. So if you're typing and saying, they're not talking back to me. No, we're not. <laughs> <laughs> we're busy controlling cameras and, and lights and everything else. Talk about lights, they're, they're hot. They're hot, are hot. Oh, jeez, you should uh, who, the joy of in a film studio, Gerard. <laughs> no, no comment. No comment. Hey, I think what keeps us going though is both of us have a real passion for sharing information. We have a passion for business mm. uh, and we want everybody to be successful, but sometimes you need to do something to keep that passion. Now you caught up with Helia Singh and Helia came in self-made person as she is absolutely sensational. And I believe you got her and turned the cameras on and you were asking her about just that very subject. Talk about passion in your business. Hi, my name is Helio Singh and today you are watching this episode and I'm talking about passion and I'm so passionate about this topic of passion. You can probably already see it and feel it. To me, passion is the reason we live. So no matter what you do in life, just do it with passion. It's not about finding the right job, the right career or right things. It's about doing it with love, being there 100% not doing it only even 99%. If you are one of those people that looking forward to Friday or on Sunday you are already grieving about Monday morning, I just saw recently a very cute GIF on YouTube that when you know shows someone that going to work and say, oh the buildings are still there, I have to go to work. If you are one of those one, I'm sorry, no matter what kind of job you have, that means you haven't found your passion and you're not enjoying what you do. Life is too short, we live it halfway. We either should do it fully or not at all. So it's not about how many years we're living and the, you know, how long we lived on this planet Earth. It's about the quality of life we had, which is obviously because we spend more of uh, our time in 24 hours at work and or study or whatever we are doing, so it is completely natural that we have to spend more time there and so might as well enjoy it. So for some people, unfortunately, because of their you know, family problem and stuff, they just go and you know, find escape in their job. But imagine if they don't love their job, what a miserable life could that be? So please make sure you love what you do. And if you haven't still find What's your passion? Which is completely normal. It's got nothing to do with the age. And I've got a news for you. Our passion changes. So you don't have to love and do the th same thing that you loved doing it when you were 20. Now, if you are 40 or 50, you don't have to be the same person. We all grow. You know, obviously it's through our self-development, environment, and spiritually. So it's completely natural. Give yourself time. You don't owe any explanation to anyone why you have changed your career or you changed the subject and the university. But whatever you do, do it fully. 
the main thing is give yourself enough time, be patient. Sometimes we have to try things in life to find out what we really love to do. Be very, very patient, but persistent. So don't go for something, try it for a week and say, no, I don't like it, I'm going to change. We are not talking about that. Give yourself enough patience and persistence to go and try to really find, to see what is it that you didn't like about that job or that study or whatever it is. But at the same time, be persistent and then the passion will find you. That's the key. Sometimes we are searching for life to do things that we love to do, but passion will come and present themselves in front of us. And that's why so many people, they get lost in to define what's their purpose in life or what's their passion. But as long as you have that attitude of learning, striving to learn, feeding your mind daily, and be persistent in that particular subject. So then you can know and become an expert in that area. And then if that time you said, no, nope, I've done the research, I spent enough time there and I don't like to do it, at least you know you will never go back to that and you will feel regretted that why well, you didn't pursue it any further. So if you want to know more about patience and passion and how it all are connected to our wealth creation, Please watch my interview with John Hughes. He is the Perth legendary entrepreneur. He tells us about his life and how he made his millions through his patience and passion that he had for life and the things that he wanted to do. So give yourself a favor, watch that, and please write to us and make your, any comments that you like. And so we, will, we are there for you. We like to share, to know what really makes you passionate about life. What really makes you get up in the morning and follow through. What really makes you to stop going out with the friends or stop watching a Netflix and really do what you wanted to do. So there should be a passion behind it. So no matter what you do in life, just do it with love and passion. The details in our channel is in the comment section below. I'll see you there and I'm sure you're going to learn a lot. Until next episode, have a happy, healthy, wealthy life. See you then. Welcome to another golf tip, brought to you by Top Tracer, your personal golf coach, helping you hit it straight down the middle. Welcome to another top tip from Top Tracer. This week we're going to talk about distance control. One of the most important things is to know how far each club goes. In the past this has been very difficult to gauge on a driving range or when you're out playing because of the inconsistencies. If we go back to the first week, if we follow those things of doing the things to get our consistent ball flight, we'll do the same with this here. So I'm going to hit five shots and then show you how you can use Top Tracer to be your personal coach to get that distance control. you enjoyed that tip and I look forward to seeing you on Top Tracer on the range here at Whaleback Golf Course in the near future.
I love watching that top tracer with, uh, <laughs> with Peter. It actually inspires me. You know, I actually watch that and think, I could have been a professional if I'd had that in my day. <laughs> it's amazing what you can do with technology. But again, yeah. you have to embrace technology. And, and it's interesting because we had Helia just before the break and talking about passion, our break going into the golf. And then if you watch Peter, he's got passion. I mean, I don't know how long he's been playing golf for, but both of them have got this passion going on. But using technology like that, I think can keep your passion going for your sport as well. Yeah. And I, do you find that in business, Chad, that by implementing new technologies and new systems, that it can reinvigorate oh, you in your business? Definitely. It, it keeps you excited about your business. Yes. Uh, as soon, uh, and I always say, as soon as you stop innovating in your business, you're going to run into trouble because then you start to stagnate. And being, meaning stagnate, we don't mean like this, because your business will go down because the other people will pass you. So stagnation doesn't mean flat line. It actually means going down very quickly. And I know when we do our consulting, if you check out our consulting page at worthingtonstoop.com, um, we, when we do consulting with people, we do talk a lot about passion, but I think what we bring to the table and why we want to bring this to the table is these are real people, this is real life experiences, and when we consult, it's real life experiences. Yeah. Talk about technology, and I don't want to go off too much off tech, but your company, your IT, I mean, you're developing technology in the medical field. Well, you identified a need, yes. and by identifying the need, we, we started in medical, and now we actually realize that not only medical can use it, but any business can use it. Absolutely incredible. Yeah. I really do love it. There the phone's going now. <laughs> I can hear one buzzing in the background in the studio here. We'll get to that in a little while. But we talked about technology. One of the technologies that sometimes gets a bad rap is Facebook. I think, yeah, or not I think, I know because we experience it every day, is that Facebook changed the algorithms so often and the rules so often, and I cannot keep up. Uh, how, how, how often have you been in Facebook jail, my friend? Yesterday. <laughs> <laughs> I couldn't post anything yesterday. Hey, if you've been in Facebook jail, put it down below. We'd love to know how many got locked out of it, posting comments on other people's yeah. sites. Yeah, and I think that's why it's important to, to listen to these shows, just to get those little golden nuggets again. Yeah, and look, we're actually, obviously, a little segue into Ivor. Ivor Kearney came back in, he was up in our lounge, and of course, he volunteered to come back in and share a bit more on Facebook. Posting into groups, it's probably one of the quickest ways you're actually getting Facebook jail, as everyone calls it, and that's what he talks about in this session. Cool. Welcome back. Thanks for, thanks for coming along to have a chat. Now, on the last episode, we talked about the importance of your image, we talked about the importance of your about page, your avatar, the links, how all that is perceived in the marketplace, and how you position yourself to your avatar. That moves on to posting into Facebook groups, it is very, very powerful if you do it correctly. Now, quick tip, chances are you don't know what groups you're in because you possibly have liked and joined things over a number of years or somebody has invited you to groups. So go to the group section on the left hand side of your Facebook business page, pull it up and have a look at the list of groups that's in there. Make sure those groups are the avatar you want to reach. If you're a professional business, there's probably little to no point advertising or posting into a buy and sell of your local area. You may get something out of it, but I doubt it highly. Then go in and search on the top search bar of business groups and spend some time researching what the business group's about. Spend some time researching the rules, making sure you're, you know when to post and how, and make sure you follow that because they will remove you and your chances are you won't get back. Build up that section of groups so you have nailed down your avatar into Perth or nationally or per, per state, per city, wherever it may be, and always have it around your avatar. So the important thing is before you start is to list out who your avatar is, the age, your what your potential client looks like. Even get a, an image on Facebook and say that is the image, that what that person will look like, they're a professional person. Where would they exist? Did they exist in local business or do they exist in Pacific businesses to a niche, such as are they contractors, et cetera, like that. And stay away from the mundane, smaller groups that hundreds and hundreds of people post daily and you just get lost in the wash. Once you have that list established, then break it up that you do no more than uh, 10 posts a day to these groups. Now within that, keep it 
very specific to who you are. Even the images and the text that you put in your post to these groups, once you've established that, make sure it's all driven towards your potential perfect client. Anything outside the realm, people will ignore it because they're confused on what you offer and who you are. So keep it really specific. And you can also have similar ads and similar texts to different groups because majority of the time it takes at least seven to eight times for somebody to see something before they actually take action. So if you were to post in the same group every Monday, it might take seven to eight weeks before somebody within that group sees it. Try different times of the day. You can go into the Facebook Insights. You can check out when potentially that is a good time and a bad time to post. Now, if you want more information and help on posting, setting up groups, joining groups, the do's and the don'ts, you'll see my information below. Click it, send me an email, get in contact with me. We're more than help, happy to help you out. But the biggest tip here is to spend time in choosing your groups. It's great having joined 5,000 groups, 2,000 there in the US, 100 in, in the UK. Are those your clients? Probably not. Probably unjoin the groups that are not within your realm of business and make that list very specific to who you are, what you are, and your potential clients. The same with LinkedIn. Make sure everything marries up. You can use the same text within your local Facebook business group posting to LinkedIn, but it cannot be any more than 200 characters long. Don't put hashtags on LinkedIn. Put hashtags on the Facebook posting. Now, why would you want hashtags? Hashtags help you rank within Google after a period of time. So keep the same hashtags, the same contact details below on every text and only change the text above. And if you want to see which ads are performing better than others, in the center of your Facebook page, there's a thing called Insights. Scroll all the way down. It'll say Show More. It'll show all your ads. Keep going till there is no Show More button to press. And then it'll, in, the, in the second quarter of that, you can see how your ad is doing and the reach and the potential um, client base you're going to. Then, if any of them are underperforming, open the ad up, change the image or change the text and close it and then repost it and track them. Track them every maybe two to three months so then you know. So by 90 days or maybe six months later, you'll have a bunch of winning ads to the right avatar, sending the correct message to who you want to connect to. Now, so you, you may have an, a looming question about where do these ads go to? They go to your inbox and your Facebook page and communicate with them through your messenger. So I hope to see you soon and see some of your ads coming my way and you never know, we might do business. See you next time. <laughs> well, I bought, geez, he's got some good information, hasn't he? And the more you talk to him, the more he, information he's got for us. So hopefully uh, we'll bring him back. Yes, and, and look, we actually put his, uh, his details, I think, for his website there. So anyone that's struggling with Facebook can go there. And same with all, all, the, all the guests that come on, look, they give their time freely on this. Yeah give you the information and if you think they can help you in your business and you think they're going to be right for you it's definitely worth catching up with them giving them a call and yeah. having a chat all the details uh, are on the ticker tapes as they go by as they questions just send them to us then we can sort them out in in order and we might even spring them on to other people as well <laughs> you never know who you're going to meet <laughs> you never know who you're going to meet now we're getting very close to the end of the show and again we both popped out and caught up with peter McLean. And uh, he is a self-made businessman, entrepreneur, still going strong. The lessons he has learned and, and he's sharing is absolutely incredible. This week, because we've done the Facebook and we're talking about Facebook marketing, we asked him and he said, well, there's a difference between marketing and advertising. And it was like, yeah. Well, walking out of that meeting, we realized that we need to do some stuff immediately on our side and coming back to the office, we did exactly that. Yeah. Again, it's just taking that piece and yeah. implementation, you know, and there were the five or six people we've had on the show, if you took one piece off each, that gives you something to do each day. Exactly. <laughs> and, and maybe you don't have a need for half of these things, but just listening and investing one hour of your time in the show, yeah. one or two of those golden nuggets can be your breakthrough in your business. I think it's the breakfast of champions, as Peter Hopkins says. He says, knowledge is the breakfast of champions. 
Talking of which, if you've got some friends and you want them to get on the right path of their business, please like and share the show and, and share all our content with them yeah. and, and encourage them to watch and, hey, maybe even participate. You have to, mm. by talking and verbalizing your ideas, amazing things happen. Yeah. If you want to come on the show and you want to be a guest on the show, just send us uh, an email at info at worthingtonstoop.com. It's in the ticker tape below. Just say, hey, guys, I'd love to come in. I've got a couple of things I'd like to talk about. We would love yeah. to have you. Well, I think we've jabbered long enough. It's Peter's turn. Peter McLernan, the difference between marketing and advertising. Morning, Michael. Look good. <laughs> good morning, Peter. How are you? Oh, going good, thanks, mate. Good. And what a great show it was last week. We had lots of feedback, especially yeah. on how you kept your record keeping. <laughs> <laughs> so detailed, mate, yeah? Yeah. yeah. We're giving all my secrets away. <laughs> I, I think someone put the king was in his castle counting all his money. <laughs> Uh, it was very, very good. You know, felt very comfortable. Um, you know, giving away a few tips. Uh, hopefully, it's going to help some people. You know, that, yeah. um, maybe just starting out. And well, one know. of the things yeah. that came through was that they said, like, you you count your money. You're really careful in your mm. doing your projections. But someone mm. had said about marketing. They're going. Mm. They they didn't quite get the difference between marketing and, and advertising or marketing yeah. and sales. Yeah. Uh, yeah. And that was one of the questions that came back for you. Yeah, gotcha. So um, over the years, being in retail, I've done a lot of marketing of all different types. You know, so as I see it, there's there's marketing and there's advertising. So marketing, you're pushing a brand or um, you know trying to get your brand as well known as possible. Whereas with advertising. You're advertising a particular product with a, a catch to it, you know, ten percent discount, come in buy before the end of the month, that type of thing. So that's a that's a motivator to purchase, whereas marketing is a motivated motivator to purchase from someone or somewhere, you know. And the two combined is the way to go. Basically. Do you find that people who start off in business don't understand the value of the marketing, just try to sell all the time or do the mm. advertising all the time? They're missing that branding aspect. Mm. Well, I think. Um, you know, they're both important, but when you're starting out, you're really trying to make that sale, you know, and probably it's not a bad thing. I think marketing comes over time. So when you've got the additional uh, money to, to expend, then you get a kind of a march forward, you know, uh, but you shouldn't drop your marketing as well. So you, you do both and you use all the different forums, you know. So we were probably one of the first ones to really start using um, online advertising and showing a bit of age here. but. Uh, when it first came out, um, you know, we had a pretty strong website. And we were we were probably one of the first in Perth to have a, a really thorough uh, online store. You know, um, so AdWords was one of the things we picked up up on pretty early. And there's this kind of um, push and pull between now between, you know, do I put my money into online marketing or do I put it into the more uh, traditional forms of advertising? And I've, I've had a bit of both or a lot of both. So. Maybe that's a subject we can discuss, you know, yeah, um, yeah. and spend a little bit of time on. So, so in the kind of marketing side of things, I've done you know radio, newspaper, and television advertising, and um, for quite a while, that's where we were putting most of our money. Um, we were advertising in the West on a Saturday and in the business pages because we sell you know business products. Uh, we're advertising mainly in the news and, and prime time on TV. And I always had the idea that you should advertise in prime time, even if you, you know, the ads are more expensive and you have less ads. You know, instead of spreading yourself thinly over the whole night or into two o'clock in the morning or whatever, just have one really good ad on Channel 7 News. You know. And then with radio, what I did there was, um, people might remember me from 6IX and Johnny Young, the Johnny Young Show. So what we did was we didn't spread ourselves across the day. We took over the morning show so, and concentrated all of our spend there. So. So what we had was um, recorded ads using my voice, so it was recognisable, you know. And then, and we'd have say three or four uh, 15, 20 second ads using my voice and <coughs> for various products. And then every morning Johnny Young would call me and I could be in Perth, I could be in China, I could be anywhere, but you know, it could be any, any time in the morning, wherever I was, but I'd take the call and we'd, we'd chat backwards and forwards about the business, what's happening that day and so on. You know, it was just a kind of an interest thing, really. You know. So that yeah. chatting backwards and forwards, <coughs> yeah. is that what you would determine as, you weren't selling it, so that's more yeah, your marketing? that's then? right, yeah. So that was the marketing part of it, and the actual ads we were doing, we'd change up every week, depending on what our specials were and so on, and use the same voice. 
So people would just automatically register that it was the same, the person doing the interview was the same person selling the products, you know, it's that kind of connection there. Yeah. Is it, when you, <coughs> when you say marketing, this, is this, just for clarity, is this where some people term it as branding? You were yeah, branding. branding. Yeah. You, well, you branded yourself as well as your business at the same time. Yeah. Well, well, you're branding in both instances, aren't you? Because you use your business name when you're selling a product, you know. So they're both branding. One's marketing, which is probably 100% branding, <laughs> and the other one's, you know, 80% trying to sell something and 20% branding. But the two work together because the thing is that in your general branding, like the show I did on 6OX, I used to call the people that listen to that as an older age group, a lot of them in business or retired or have connections, you know, in, in business. So I used to call them my barbecue group because <laughs> they... <laughs> On the weekend, they'd be at the barbecue and there'd be 100 people, or, you know, say 20 people at the barbecue. Yeah. And someone would say, oh, I'm going to buy opera spinners this week. And my barbecue man would say, oh, you, you should go to McLernan's. <laughs> <laughs> I hear him on the radio every morning or something like that, you know. So they're my barbecue people. So see, that, that's, that's marketing, really, I suppose, or branding, yeah. yeah. Even so, today, a lot of people recognise the McLernan brand, you know, and a lot of people have done business with us in Perth, yeah. It's, it's interesting you, you, you said the barbecue. So basically what you're saying is if you make yourself interesting enough, mm. people will then have a reason to talk about you yeah. at a barbecue. That's, yeah. that's a great well, marketing aspect. Well, you're first in mind. You know the old first in mind? So, yeah. you know, you think of uh, products like, um, uh, I'm not sure what it is these days, but mm. maybe a luxury car or whatever. You know, the first thing, that, or it used to be a safe car. So the thing was, what's the safest car on the road? And everyone would say Volvo mm. in those days, you know, because Volvo advertised the safety side of their thing and made themselves number one in mind for their product, number one in mind for safety. So, so we wanted to be number one in mind for you know, business products. So that person at that barbecue, when it came to business products of any kind, we were number one in their mind. <laughs> So, you know, we've invaded their mind. <laughs> so, so when you were doing the marketing aspect and you're having a talk yeah. to Johnny Young, yeah. um, what type of things, you, mm. you, you didn't talk about specials then, you were talking about something else, were you, yeah. or were you just talking business yeah, in general? just business in general, you know, how's business going, where are you today, you know, what's happening, you know, just that kind of general conversation. But Johnny was very good at it, so obviously, you know, he's, um, you know, uh, an expert at radio presenter and you know, personality and so on. So Johnny made it very easy, just to have a conversation basically. You know. Do yeah. you find that when you have to switch from advertising to marketing, that is a key then that, that people can pick up on? Try mm. and make your marketing more conversational? Mm. Yeah, yeah. Well, what it is is I think that um, if you've done your uh, marketing properly, when someone sees your ad or they're looking for a product, Right, so they're looking for office furniture. So they go to um, the internet and they put in office desk or something. Right, up pops three or four, three or four um, retailers. But what they see is McLernan's. Or they've seen me on TV or they've heard me on the radio. So there's a connection made. I know that company. I know that guy. Or I've heard about these people, and they'll go to you hopefully you know, yeah. first because of your marketing. You know, so that's how the two connect. You know, people. People might look for you particularly because they've seen your marketing and advertising, so they search for you, or um, they're searching in general and your name pops up and they recall it, and therefore they pick you to, you know, to um, come and have a look at your products. Now, in marketing, as we all know, there's a, a funnel that looks like that, it's an inverted triangle, you know? Yeah. So, so um, we're, not, we're not trying to sell, you know, if we were trying to sell Christmas presents at, at, in late December, you know, then, <clears throat> Everybody at the top of that triangle will be interested because they're all, you know, they're all shopping for that particular thing at that particular time. Yeah. <clears throat> but when you look at things like business products, you know, we've, we've got, we've got to kind of condense down and get to the, the people that are really looking for business products at any one time. And there's not a huge market out there, so you're not looking for all these scattered. There's not a lot of point, you know, being on um, TV during a children's program or something. You know, mm. it's obvious that you hunt in your territory that you know. So. So you advertise in, a, in a, a business program or whatever, yeah? So what you're trying to do is narrow the, the uh, funnel down to get to as many people as possible, you know, at the, the cheapest price, you know? And I think what I've worked out o over the years is that these days we don't do any um, uh, of the, of the um, traditional type advertising. Yeah. Because as I see it, and it could be wrong because it's still, you know, we're only 20 years down the track, so, <laughs> you know, people could look back in 50 years and see them dead wrong, but, you know, as I see it, 
people people see you on TV, so that's your marketing you know, side of things, right? Mm. Um, but it's, it's not as important as it used to be. So you know, you'd be you'd be in the newspaper, you'd be on TV, you'd be on radio, but you have to be repetitive. So you've got to be on there quite often with the same message in the same place, so people see you time and time again. Repetitive, mm. you know. So that's so that's quite a big spend to get to so many people at the top. But almost every one of those people, all the way down the funnel, go to the internet at the end of the day to you know, um, shop or, or make a purchase or determine who they're going to buy from, most yeah. of the time, yeah. more and more often, more you know, these days particularly. So <clears throat> in a way, you, you can skip all of that, although there's a bit of a danger in that as well. And you can, do, you can put all your money into, into AdWords, which is what we've been doing for the last four or five years. So AdWords, you know, uh, we've got a large number of products. So we've got thousands of products yeah. across five or six major categories, all, all under the tag of business, um, business equipment and uh, furniture. You know, so there's a single tag, but there's lots of subdivisions in there. So, so when we go to AdWords, we've got to, for example, cover you know shelving, racking, office furniture, fit outs, uh, office hire, um, shop fittings. You know, you name it, and then all the subcategories within there. So. With racking, you've got racking, shelving, long span, you know, um, pallet racking, so many different keywords. So the first thing is obviously you, you pepper your site and pages of your site and sections of your site with those keywords, obviously, you know, to get a higher ranking and so on. But so we, we put our money into AdWords because we want to be number one under each of our major categories. So if you do a search on, on um, AdWords today for any one of the categories that we operate in, you'll see us pop up as number one. Mm -hmm. Now we're high generically as well. We might be number number one or number two for that search term generically. That used to be a big thing, you know, because we were always number one or number two generically. We didn't have to worry about AdWords, you know. But along comes Google and, you know, they yeah. want to make some money. So they start putting categories above the best selections because, you know, the whole, the algorithms, you know, within the internet uh, are designed to capture the best result for the search. So if we're number one for office furniture, there's a reason for it. We've been around longer, we have more products, or there's some reason more people are searching for us, you know. So, so being number one was something we maintained all the time. Um, but then they put, um, they put uh, paid marketing on top of that, so that made you about number four, five, or six, you know, depending on how many people were paying to advertise that. And then they put um, Google Maps in there. So, you know, that's another three or four. We're, we're number one or two in Google Maps anyway, generally speaking. And we're one or two under each category generically. But it's not enough because above you are still three or four people prepared to pay to be one, two, three, and four. So we pay to be number one as well. So we're number one <laughs> under AdWords, generally one or two in um, Google Maps, and then number one, two, or three, or whatever in, you know, for the search term generically, you know. But what we find is no matter where people are looking, they do come, the bottom of the funnel is definitely the internet and you have to be on there. Yeah. One thing that struck me just listening to you, Peter, is yeah. when you talked about being on radio and I can imagine people listening to your conversation and the trust factor building up. So mm. those barbecue people, as you yeah, phrased yeah, it, yeah. I love that phrase, yeah. Yeah. Um, <laughs> had a trust factor to be able to refer you. Mm. Are you finding building the trust factor online a challenge or mm. is it just a different uh, yeah. approach? Yeah, okay. That, that is one of the bigger challenges because we use the same advertising in WA uh, for the McLernan's business space website. And we've retained McLernan's by the way, just because of this marketing, you know. So many people recognize us as McLernan's but nobody at the moment recognizes or very few search for business space. But what we're trying to do in order to go national is to rebrand re ourselves as business space. But the opposite's the, uh, the same in all the other states. Nobody recognises McLernan's, you know, and business space is our brand. So for the time being in Perth, we're operating as McLernan's business space in order to have that transition from the old McLernan's to the new business space, you know. So we operate, uh, I think it's about seven or eight websites that all have online stores in them, you know? So six of those websites are, uh, are dedicated to one group of products. So one might be safes only, for example, one's chairs and tables only, Another one's office furniture, another one's business machines, another one's just shredders. So each of those are fully sites dedicated because you can, you can, um, you know, uh, set those sites up so the keywords and the phrases and so on are within that one website just for that one product. Yeah, 
most of them eventually lead to Business Base, which is the central website that has all of those product categories in it. Yeah. Um, now, so we're marketing those sites Australia wide, <clears throat> but in, in a lot of cases, because the um, name isn't well known yet, um, you get a lot less return for your expenditure in AdWords in other states than you do in WA. You know, just because that's got to come down to knowing the brand, yeah. being local. Or yeah, and which all adds up to trust. Yeah. If you don't have a premise in the state, you know you're not as trustworthy as someone who actually has some skin in the game and has a branch here. That's why we're putting a branch in every state, together yeah. with our marketing on, and online stores. Yeah. I am conscious of your time on this. One, but you've just said something really interesting. I think it's mm. worth touching on just as we wrap up this section. Sure. You've done individual sites for some individual specialised products. Yeah. Is that to give the visitor of that site the impression that? they know everything about safe you want safe you come yes. here is yeah. it to build that? yeah most of those sites have a warehouse so we have safe warehouse chair warehouse and so on yeah okay so um what say the one dedicated to shredders it's quite a popular site because we can put a lot of information in there and just design the whole site to suit just mm. just shredders you know one one product um uh, I think it does build up the trust factor. We can put things in there like, um, you know, how to select the right shredder. You know, what, what, uh, what, what's the result? How many, you know, how fine is the shredding? You know, um, brands, price, effectiveness, security, all of those issues mm. can be fully discussed within that site. And it does bring people there just to have a look to make a selection, you know, to think about what, what shredder they might, might be most useful for them. So you're you know. still keeping to the McLernan <laughs> style of educating people. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Well, um, you know, we, we, as I said, we don't want to be just selling people something. We want to be, you know, providing the best product, uh, you know, and the best advice for that product and be part of the business community. Yep. <laughs> well, uh, there we go. Peter McLernan, the difference between marketing and advertising. That was really good actually going to his offices there, Gerard. The, 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 the advantage we have is that we can go to people's businesses and yeah. see how they do things as well. Yes. Um, and I always steal with my eyes mm. to see what you can use in your own business. Yeah. Look, a few people have asked us about One Minute Millionaire as well. And they said, what, what's that all about? Well, One Minute Millionaire is where we create one minute videos. So it is a millionaire strategies condensed into a minute. So in one minute, so there's no excuse not to watch it, yeah. you can get that information. They're all on our One Minute Millionaire page. All of them, yeah. OneMinuteMillionaire.com.au, you can go there. And, and that's what One Minute Millionaire is all about. They're one minute top strategies for millionaires and self-made people like the ones that have been on the show and many, many others that we just share with you in 60 seconds. But, but also, it's not to become a millionaire in one minute. No. It is like winning the 100 meters we said last week. Yes. It, it takes months of preparation to do the 100 meters and then yeah. win it. The same with being a millionaire. You have to practice. Mm. And this is part of, of, of your journey. Yeah. And when we came up with the concept for One Minute Millionaire, we're saying it really spent off from that 1% factor. Yeah. And you're saying little things every day mount up to really, really big things. So we said, well, we can give a strategy in a minute. But imagine if we did a minute every day of the year. That's 365 strategies. Things have got to change. But also, if you have all of this background and the opportunity comes up, you can make the decision in one minute. And that is, I'm watching the clock, I think that's about a wrap for today's show. But there is the old saying, successful people do things even when they don't want to. That's the difference. <laughs>